It is now time to experience the buzz. A podcast that takes an inside look at amazing people doing amazing things. Get ready for some great conversation that will be fascinating, educational, and inspiring. We will also leave room to help small businesses in a big way. Now, here's your host, entrepreneur Steve Buzzard. Hey friends, welcome in. It is Experience the Buzz. Apologize for the length of time between episodes, but we are working on things, not only to give you a great audio version, but to give you a great video version too. That's right, we are on YouTube. So let me start there by telling you, you can subscribe by going to YouTube and finding Experience the Buzz. And what that does is it'll alert you to let you know that any new episodes are coming out. So today's guest, I'm going outside of the local realm to talk about a subject. It's one I'm very passionate about. It is youth sports. And I have got the guy, John O. Sullivan. In 2012, he was the founder of the Change in the Game Project. He has done a TED Talk. He has written two books. He's got his own podcast, of, of which he has done 264 episodes called Way of Champions. And this guy, man, when he speaks about youth sports, Every time I hear him, I'm like, okay, got to pass that along. It is such great information, and he has taken the time to join us today on Experience the Buzz. We'll have more on John in just a moment, but it is time for what we like to call What's the Buzz? And I'm going to keep it very simple, and that is this podcast is about Sacramento. And yes, there are subjects that maybe that go outside of the ranks like we're doing today, but really, I am all about entrepreneurs. I'm about small business owners and great personalities that reside here in the capital city. So what I'm trying to get to is I would love for you as a small business, if you need to get the word out, Guess what? I'm your guy. We are already doing it for four sponsors, of which you will hear about later on in the program. Everything is customizable. And now that we've added the video element, that's all the more reason to jump on board as a sponsor. You can simply go to buzzardball.com. You can click how to become a sponsor, and then all the information is right there. And of course, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, and I'll be glad to help you out. So today's episode, John O'Sullivan, it is called Changing the Game Project, has everything to do with youth sports. What is it based on? It's based on education, of just getting information out there that how to be a better coach, how to be a better parent, and ultimately, knowing that sports at a young age is truly for the kids. So don't wanna waste any more time. I'm looking forward to you being able to hear this episode. I know I was excited, so let's get to it and enjoy today's conversation with John O. Sullivan. Welcome in, everybody. It's another edition of Experience the Buzz, and this time we go outside the local ranks, and I am really excited for this conversation. The man you see, or the man you're listening to, whether it be the podcast or on YouTube, is John O. Sullivan. He is the founder of Changing the Game Project. I came across him through a YouTube video. That's right, because he's also attached to the Positive Coaching Alliance, Uh, And with my affiliation with running youth basketball leagues and summer camps, it was great to see the TED Talk that happened in 2014 because for me, I remember watching this man, John O'Sullivan, and going, okay, that's my people right there. That's, That's who I need to hear from and more people need to know about what it is that he is talking about. So John, welcome to Experience the Buzz. It is so good to have you it's great it's great to be on it's it's also great to uh, you know obviously we're on video and i'm looking at your your core values behind you there on the wall i'm like there there's a guy that i can i can relate to as well so well john we have been in touch uh over the years and either through text or you know um conversation or what but not like this and so this is really a special opportunity for me because you are actually living out the passion that I truly have as well. Now, I wear a lot of hats. I do a podcast. I'm a DJ. I'm an auctioneer. I run youth sports, but your primary thing is centered around youth sports. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many years I have screamed so loudly for parents and for coaches if they could just understand the beauty of allowing youth sports to be what it should be. And I have to say that you really 
are that voice. I truly feel that because it did start for me. And I wish I would have ran into you earlier, but it was that TED Talk because I remember Positive Coaching Alliance was coming our way uh, at school. You know, we are big believers in that and the PCA. Um, and I was, you know, just kind of directed to your, your TED Talk. And that really kind of changed things for me. And I said, okay, this is the guy I'm going to follow and we're going to go with. So my curiosity is how you got into it, right? Because your background is in soccer. You've coached, you've played uh, collegiately and professionally. So the good thing about you too is you've seen all levels. So mm -hmm. tell me how you got to this place. You know, I, I like you said, I had follow this career you know i grew up in new york i was a multi-sport kid and you know played everything by the season and then really in high school focused on soccer and you know got to play division one college and got to play pro for a little while i got hurt and you know wanted to keep chasing the ball you know it was like oh go to law school or just stay outside in shorts and it was an easy decision so uh i coached some college soccer and then got into youth um when i met my wife and she was doing her medical residency and so um it worked there and and i really actually liked the youth side of things and so i did that full-time for many years i was an executive director of an organization and coaching and you know when my kids were you know, five and six. And I started looking at this as like a parent, right? And not just uh, not just someone coaching someone else's kids and saying, what, what would I want for my own kids? And I think when you become a parent, right, you understand trust. So you understand like, well, I wouldn't trust a coach just because he can shoot free throws or kick a soccer ball or whatever. Trust means something more. And what do I want from this experience if I'm going to pay for this? I want to see my kid smiling. I want to see my kid learning, being challenged, being treated with respect, all that sort of thing. And, and I just, I think I was burnt out on running an organization and thought, me, you know, I like to write, maybe I'll just write a book. And, and so I wrote this book, Changing the Game. And I realized uh, it's actually not that hard to write a book. It's really hard to sell a book. Um, and so I, uh, started a blog around it. And really the blog is what took off first. Yeah. Um, I like to research, add science in the blog led to the Ted talk and then everything kind of blew up from there with speaking. And I mean, we're four plus years, I think now into a podcast, maybe five. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking virtual events now, of course, and, and still doing live speaking events, starting to book a bunch of those again international conferences things like that and uh yeah it's been a crazy journey and you know I, i've always told people don't ask me what the five-year plan is because i if i had ever said this is what the five-year plan is or even the six-month plan i would have been wrong so well and john you you've listed some of those things that you have done and i i really want to reiterate this so if you didn't catch that First of all, we mentioned he is the founder of the Change in the Game Project, and we're going to get into that and what that is about. He's also the author of two number one best-selling books. Change in the Game is the first one he wrote, and then the follow-up. Oh, yes, Every Moment Matters. When that came out, I got my hands on it. I think I read it in two days, and I'm like, okay, every coach needs to see this. And so he has two books. Uh, we mentioned the podcast, which is now 264 episodes, so mad respect. Way to go. I'm yeah. at your 81 for me, so. So yeah, like, I'm just going to go. continue that journey huh. and it's called way of champions podcast and features all sorts of people talking about athletics from so many standpoints. Uh, we mentioned the fact that he's a former collegiate and professional soccer player. We talked about him coaching. Um, he's also on the national advisory board for the PCA, which is the positive coaching Alliance, along with the national association for physical literacy. So you said it started with the blog. So I imagine in your mind, like you're, you're just like hitting all these different topics, which are amazing topics. Like, for example, encouraging your kids to try everything before intervening. Coaches who are proactive. The worst part of youth sports, which is the ride home that you always talk about and stuff. What was your thought? Because you said, you know, you didn't know what the plan was. But as you're writing these blogs, you're probably just writing them from a parent perspective, correct? From a parent perspective and a coach perspective, mm -hmm. you know, when I when I started, I, I really felt because that first book was for parents to help their kids in sport. And and it's relevant to coaches. And let's face it, most coaches are also parents. Sure. Um, but what was interesting when I started getting asked to speak a lot, you know, I'd come in to talk to parents. And the first question the parents would ask is, hey, this is great. Are you talking to the coaches? 
I'm like, well, why are, why am I not talking to the coaches? I mean, I've coached for, you know, at that point, 20 something years, right. I've, I've coached at a lot of levels. I, I understand what it means to be a coach and, you know, you don't have to be a basketball player to talk to basketball coaches or soccer coaches. Like I, I really think there's the X's and O's, right. There, there's the physical requirements of your sport that makes you a trainer. And then coaching is like where we meet in the middle inspiration, communication, feedback, motivation, team culture, all that sort of stuff. I'm like, so it doesn't matter if you're a ski coach or a volleyball coach or soccer or hockey or whatever you can learn, right? Like you, you can learn from other coaches. There's so much to learn. And so, um, you know, that, that's just sort of this, this journey of, uh, you know, I was writing from the perspective of if I was a coach, what would I want to know? If I was a parent, what would I want to know? Um, and really trying to dispel some myths, right? Yes. The myth that, oh my God, the earlier my kid specializes, the better off he or she will be. The myth that, um, you know, if I want it more than my kid, that'll all work out all right. The myth that, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, so many of them, right? That, oh, there's scholarships for everyone out there if you just, you know, do enough. And, and so I felt like, man, I, if I can dispel some myths, I can take some of the pressure and insanity off for, for some parents who are just feeling beat up and dragged down by, by sports. And, um, obviously it resonated. So <laughs> no, it's been great. And that's the thing is like, I don't know for you tell me, John, I, I look at people as a director of a youth basketball league and it's very simple to me. And it's been a journey for me. I've been doing it for about 16 years or so. And I look at people and I simply go, they either get it or they don't get it. And it's really hard for the ones that don't get it because I'm not sure if they're willing to put in the time and effort to say, you know what, I need to learn so that maybe I do get it. Because I would never push on someone that doesn't get it. What is the right way? Because in essence, I don't think they're listening to me. And I don't want to put, I would never put myself up on a pedestal to say, hey, this is the way it's got to be. But it's like, can we all learn so that we can have that positive culture that ultimately always is going to be about the kids? I just feel like parents get in the way. Well, yeah, to an extent. And, and I think it's really important for coaches and people to remember that those parents who, who don't get it, they also love their kids. Yes. They're just loving them in an unhelpful way. And so the challenge is how can I change their behavior in a way that is not offensive or whatever, you know, I, I have to sort of nudge them and I have to just, th th there's this great, um, Oh God, I forget the guy's name. Um, uh, hate, I think he's a researcher and he talks about behavior change and he gives the, the analogy of, um, the rider and elephant in a path ahead. And he says, you know, we have to think the rider is our rational mind. And the elephant is our emotional mind. And then there's the path. And no matter how much data you have, no matter how rational you are, um, eventually the elephant's going to go wherever the heck it wants to go, right? And so when you're trying to change behavior, you can't just give people facts and figures. You have to um, emotionally motivate them as well. And what happens um, – often in sports is people are on the wrong path until that emotional thing smacks them in the face. Their kid tears their ACL. Their kid says, I don't want to play basketball anymore. Um, they get a, an abusive coach and then they go, Whoa, 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 what happened? Right. And then finally the, the emotion goes, this isn't the right thing. And so um, I, I think we always just have to remember that 99% of parents are, are coming from a good place and some are mentally ill. Right. And there's not a lot we can do about them, yeah. but like, you know, that 99% give them information, teach them, create a culture that says, this is how we, this is how we do things here. Um, and if this, if you don't want to do things this way, that's okay. But then go someplace else because it's just not going to be a good fit. And I found in a lot of years of coaching of teams and clubs that that's what most people are looking for. Yeah. People are, you know, parents don't want to show up and yell at the other fans. 
I don't want to yell at the ref. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, God, I hope we can give this referee or official a good roasting this morning. Like, no, they want a good referee and they want good coaching and, and they want to go, wow, that was a fun game to watch. Um, right. So, so we have to be careful about labeling parents as one thing or the other um, because their intentions are good. And when someone's messing up, you know, it's usually out of love, not spite. I think it's a good way to put it too. Uh, that that's very helpful. It's like something I know, but just hearing you say it like is very helpful to me because I I think of those people and I go, you know what? Yeah, they do love their kid, but they they maybe they shouldn't be in that position to actually coach their kid because you know. And you'll speak to this as well. I remember coaching my boys and my daughter for a period of time, mostly my boys through all three sports and basketball in particular. And I remember the last year before coaching my son, Max, uh, he went on a team that for the first time I wasn't the coach and he ended up having a great experience. And he was the son that would, you know, we would push each other's buttons and stuff. And then I had my oldest son who like, you know, he was the, he was the leader and just kind of took child, over. He just complies. Yeah. 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 yeah I just junior that. coach. He did his thing <laughs> and stuff, but it was very interesting because at that moment, when I saw my middle son being coached by someone else, it really, in that moment, helped me step back and say, wow, it just gave me a different perspective. I'm curious if that was the same for you, because you, you're making the transformation of being a coach to going into this space where you are really just trying to provide education and information for people to be better parents and better coaches. Yeah. And I mean, I, I still coach, you know, I think, and I think that's an important thing because, you know, keeping your toe dipped in the water, you know, you, you're living with the reality. And certainly these last two years with COVID, no one had ever coached in that environment before. So to talk to coaches trying to coach through this thing where, you know, in the beginning, maybe kids were wearing masks, they weren't going to school sport was their only social interaction that they got all day with their friends, um, training environment, mental health issues with children, which we're just scratching the surface on now. Um, it, you know, to be coaching in that environment three, four days a week, I could get up in front of a room or a computer screen and be like, you know, I feel your pain. You know, this is hard right now. So, so I still, I still coach. And I mean, you're exactly right, Steve. Like, coaching your own kid is hard. Um, and every one of your children is different and the ability to listen to them and make sure it's still a good fit season after season is an important thing. And my oldest is very different than my youngest, um, who my coach now. Um, but it's also an incredibly beautiful and rewarding thing. And, and, you know, the, I think the best advice I can give to any dad or mom who is also coaching their kid is, wear two hats. You have a coaching hat and you have a parent hat and you have to take off the coach hat when practice ends because if practice never ends for your kid, you're, you're in trouble and you're going to have discussions with your child as they get older and, and care about their performance to say, dad, uh, what do you think of X, Y, and Z? And that's, you know, would you like me to answer you as your coach or your dad? <laughs> you know, well, and that bridges into something that I know is very profound for you. Uh, and you mentioned it in the TED Talk, uh, which I kind of want to uncover because I think it's fascinating when someone gets asked to do a TED Talk. I, I just feel like that's a big deal. So I, I do want to get back to that. But there were five words that you mentioned uh, in 2004, and you don't say it your own. You got it from a coach named Bruce Brown. And it was, I love watching you play. And then you shared some examples, which I thought was pretty awesome, of what those words, as simple as they are, really mean. They, like they make a huge impact. And I would think even coming out of COVID, they might be even more emphasized now. T totally. And, and you know, like I said, I, I mean, I, I think the idea of loving watching your kids play is in the Bible. Like, you know, love them unconditionally. And, and, and again, so many parents like, they they love their kids, but they their bot their actions, their words after a loss, after a bad performance, whatever. Don't say that. They say that my happiness is dependent on how your team does or whatever. And so, you know, I'll, I'll even give you an updated story that that's one that I share now at my talks, which is super powerful. Um, and it was a story that Kobe Bryant told before his death, and and he was talking. You know, he said when I was twelve years old playing on a summer league basketball team, I didn't score a single point all summer. 
playing against other 12 year olds, Kobe Bryant. Wow. Right. And, and the interviewer is like, what happened? He goes, cause I was terrible. Right. And he says, and I was so upset. And my dad pulled me aside. He said, you know, Kobe, whether you score zero, or you score 60, I'm going to love you no matter what. Mm. And he said, that gave him the freedom. He's like, heck with that, I'm going to score 60. Right. But, but that freed him from the burden of being responsible for his dad's happiness or, or, or love. Yep. And so that idea as a parent that your kids know, I love you no matter what, you will see a whole different athlete out there. Um, they'll compete freely. They'll take chances. They're not afraid of mistakes. They'll get over it quicker, you know, and, 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 and the end of things, like, even if you're really, 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 really 1% or good, you still only play sports for a third of your life. And then you're in the bar league, like everyone else. So <laughs> like what, you know, my God, like why it's amazing to me how many parents ruin their relationship with their children because of sports. Yeah. A game that if I asked you the score two years later, you wouldn't remember, but that's the day that my son stopped wanting me to come to the game. You know, that's, oh man, so well said. I did not know that about Kobe Bryant, but that, that makes such a huge difference. And right now I'm, I'm like going through and for, for me and my boys, and I'll say mostly my boys, because my daughter was a volleyball player. I didn't coach her. Well, I coached a little volleyball, but not much. I didn't know much. Uh, but it was baseball and basketball. And we have endless conversations about our memories. Like we would pick a song that, that we would drive to the ballpark to. That would be like our song. And they were the goofiest songs, like me and my gang from Rascal Flats to a Bubba Sparks song. I mean, just weird stuff. But that's what we remember, right? And it's those yeah. memories that create those memories. And, and really not making it a negative thing. And I, I, I think everything that you said is is just absolutely huge. Wow. Okay. I got to kind of take a breath. John O'Sullivan is our uh, guest. He is the founder of Changing the Game Project. Also has worked with Positive Coaching Alliance, which I know a lot of people know about that because they've done so much work and they are affiliated with big names that you know. So, I mean, Phil Jackson comes to mind. You got Brad Stevens, you got Steve Kerr, Doc Rivers. I mean, and there's great soccer players that are also a part of this program too. And John is a part of that. They've done some amazing work. And so to finish out the segment, I wanted to go to that TED talk of, first of all, how you got invited. Then what was your idea of like, what am I going to say in the time that they give me, which ended up being very powerful, 14 minutes. Take me through that because that had to be a lot of fun. It's funny. I don't think about a lot of those steps anymore, but when you bring it up, like I picture, you know, the house I lived in and where I was doing this work and putting together the talk and my good friend and mentor who helped me put the talk together. And, and, you know, it's funny, you know, in that 14 minute talk, I probably put a hundred hours into, sure. you know, um, it was such an amazing exercise because, um, it's so hard to be concise and whatever. And the, you know, what they say in Ted is ideas worth sharing, right? So what's your idea worth sharing? It's not just a, a bunch of facts and figures and whatever. And, and after I did the Ted talk, I, I helped the local Ted event for the next couple of years as like a speaker mentor and help people put talks together. And that was fantastic as well. Um, and, and helping them get, coalesced around this idea of what's your idea we're sharing why am i going to remember this right um now and it's funny because you know people remember i love watching you play or whatever they remember i mean local moms or you know i'll be on a camping trip with friends and someone i don't know and they're like wait you're the i love watching you play guy you know like i don't have a name that's it so so yeah I, you know i just I, I got invited by, you know, this committee. They said, we're interested. Would you submit? And I was like, me, I'm Ted talk. Like, no, you know, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And um, then I, I got, I got it right. It was like, I think I did the talk in April. And so it was January where they said, you're, you're on the agenda. Um, two weeks later, I, I had an awful skiing crash and broke my back in 11 oh, wow. places. And um and so I, I prepared for that thing and the brace actually for the Ted talk was the first time I took the brace off, um, to go give a talk. So, wow. um, 
I, uh, you know, so, so it was a, a crazy journey, but what was really funny is I, I had a lot of the information and stuff, but I didn't have the idea. And my mom, who's God bless her soul is, you know, 86 years old now, you know, at the time. So 78 years old, you know, I'd sent her, uh, I recorded the PowerPoint, my talk and everything. And, and, you know, she, she has this way of, of telling you the horrible truth in such a nice way that you accept it. And she said, wow, John, that was very nice, but what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> this was like two weeks out and I still didn't have oh. was the idea we're sharing. And that's when I kind of came around, you know, start with, I love watching you play and, yeah. and, and go from there. And, and then, and then I was like, ah, now I get it, you know? And so it was a crazy thing. The, the Ted event, didn't announce any of the speakers ahead of time. So there was a speaker's dinner the night before. So I show up at the speaker's dinner to find out, well, who am I giving a talk alongside? And it was like, you know, Bob Hurley from Hurley Clothing and uh, a guy who was like the commander of two space shuttle missions. And um, John Gray, the guy who wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus and you know, like, and, and I'm just like, holy cow. And then they, they hand out the program and my mentor, you know, my friend gives me the thing. And I'm like, why is my name on here first? He goes, oh, you're going first. <laughs> Leading like, off, John O'Sullivan. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, I'm going first? So anyway, it was an amazing event. Um, my, my dad was able to fly out and watch it, and my brother, and yeah, it was cool. Oh, that's great. It lives forever. So with that, do they give you a time allotment? I've always been curious about that. Yeah, they do. And and I imagine every event is different. Um, they do. It, it's definitely under 18. But when you put together a program, you don't want 18, 18, 18. So, you know, some people get six minutes or nine minutes or whatever. And so, you know, when you put something together, of course, it's going to be too long. And then you're cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And so... Yeah, I mean, I got, yeah, I think I was, I think I was allotted 12 and I, and I got them to extend it to 14 because it was good, but that there was it. Go. But then it was crazy too. Like the, here's another insider Ted story, please. So, so practicing it, right. I'm sitting there with my, um, with my stopwatch on my phone, right. Doing the talk seeing the time and i'm like yep 1350 1350 like i got it right um so then you get on stage and there's a there's a clock down by your feet out of the camera that that shows how gone you but it's a countdown timer so now my time is totally screwed up because i've only practiced on a count up timer and now oh, it's a countdown no. timer so yeah it was cool <laughs> oh, that's great. And it's great, too, because it's so iconic because anybody step, steps onto a TED stage, uh, you know, you have the red curtains, you have the TED kind of logo and everything. And then there's like this kind of, you know, just like light applause and then everyone's quiet and then you go. Right. Yeah. And then and then you just open up. And again, that's the first time I came across you because you had been featured on the PCA site, which I was a big fan of. And I just remember, I mean, it was, it was prophetic for me. Cause I, again, I, after that, I said, this is my people. This mm -hmm. is a guy I got to follow. So John, I really commend you for that and being able to have that moment. And what I love about it too, is it, it stands forever. Here we are in 2022 and I can still watch that uh, from 2014 and it still has that same effect. It's a good, it's a good speaker demo video. Yep. You know, I, I mean, Here's another insider thing. If anyone ever wants to be a speaker, right, is like, and you probably know this. You said you're an auctioneer, mm -hmm. right? So who hires the auctioneer? It's not the CEO, right? It, it's it's someone underneath that, and so they're hiring a per. So so it's same with me. Who's ever hiring me to come speak for a, a, an event wants to look good for their boss. So if I screw up, if I show up and I have the flu and I I am not having a good day. At least when you have a TED talk as your demo, they can go, but he gave a TED talk. Like, look, this was good. Right. You know, he was just an idiot today or whatever. Um, so, so yeah, so it's a really good speaker demo video. And I've never done a speaker demo video because I have a TED talk. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that first segment with John O'Sullivan. What if I told you it just keeps getting better? So appreciative of someone of his stature that would be able to join us 
on Experience the Buzz. Now it's time to thank our sponsors. We've got four of them. I'm going to tell you about two of them, and we are going to start with Matt, the mortgage guy. I'm talking about Matt Gouget. A great thing about becoming a sponsor is I like to take the podcast format and say, hey, let's tell your story. So you can hear Matt's story in episode 28. What has he done? Well, if you're looking at buying a home or refinancing, that's what Matt does, and he does very well. You can find that at M T mg.com or just simply call them at 916-802-9291. Matt and his team have helped me and my wife Kristen with the refinance. Took about a month uh, from start to finish. What I loved about it is that his team was with me every step of the way. Had questions, boom, they get right back to me. So you will be serviced well. Also, when you go to the website, mtmg.com, uh, Matt offers cool tools for you, including the home purchase qualifier, along with the refin refinance rate checker, along with today's mortgage rates and loan options. And I should also tell you that Matt is a YouTube star. You I'm not even there. I'm three episodes in. This guy has got over 500 videos and over a million views, and it's very simple. He simply wants to educate everyone on these subjects that sometimes are tough to tackle. So make sure to check him out. You can easily find him at Matt the Mortgage Guy. So Matt the Mortgage Guy, proud sponsor of Experience the Buzz. Our second sponsor that we wanted to highlight is Little Whale Swim School. They are the premier swim school here in Sacramento, located at 4106 El Camino Avenue. You can find them at littlewhaleswim.com. They're also all over social media, Little Whale Swim, either on Instagram or Facebook. Number 916-790-5945. Here's what stands out about being the premier swim school in Sacramento. And that is the easy, or I should say, custom-built indoor facilities. And the best part, it's year-round. That's right. It's not just summer. It's year-round. And so if you're a baby up to an adult, they have classes for everyone. You're going to be well covered. They've got a great staff that will take good care of you. And of course, you can get your swimmer strokes in if you're getting ready for swim team, whatever it might be, because summer is around the corner. So a big thank you to Little Whale Swim School, along with Matt the Mortgage Guy, proud sponsors of Experience the Buzz. Now let's get back to our conversation with John O. Sullivan. And uh, two big things that are actually a couple things that, that I want to unroll from that was, and I'll just say them, the great race to nowhere, mm. why do kids play, and why do kids quit? Mm. And so I want to address those things. And maybe you can exp explain for people what you mean by the great race to nowhere. The race to nowhere was the, is, is, is still today the most popular blog we ever wrote. I mean, it got like millions of social shares and everything. And I mean, it sort of just encompassed this whole, uh, again, a race to nowhere. Like what are, what are we doing in sport? Right early specialization, more practices, more commitment, more adult values, less about kids, you know, kids shuttling from here to there, no smiles on their faces. What are we trying to accomplish? This is like a race to nowhere that leads to kids dropping out, burned out, injured, hating sports, hating their parents, um, and, and, and potentially psychological, emotional, social issues because of all that and physical issues that last for the rest of their life. Right. And so for me, that was like, yeah, there's too many places where sport is just this race to nowhere. It's just nothing. Um, and, and, and we can do better. And so, yeah, you know, some of those blogs, right. So, you know, why do kids play? They play because they enjoy it because it's fun, right? Kids use the word fun. I use the word enjoyment. Like, you know, they want to get better. It doesn't mean fooling around. Fun means being challenged positive coaching, good team dynamics, uh, working hard, trying hard, learning new things. That's fun um, for kids. And so that's why they that's why they play. Why do they quit? Well, when it's not fun and when they lose ownership, when they lose intrinsic motivation or they get injured so often that they stop getting better. That's why they quit. And and so as a coach, as a parent, I should really be aware of these things, right? Because right. If I'm not aware of them, like if I know why kids will make kids show up week after week, year after year, then shouldn't those be in intentionally incorporated into every practice that I do? I think they probably should be. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at it, we you put up that graphic during that TED Talk and it had uh, just a group of 10 girls and seven of them 
or X'd out. And that yeah. represented how many kids drop out by the age of 13 of sports. Because what is it with sports? You want them to be able to be coming back year after year, right? That's that's the whole thing. And you have to, you have to, the solid foundation has to be fun. So just so you know, for my summer camp, we go be a good sport, play hard, have fun. And always remember, it's just a game, right? And that, that has been it since day one. I've been doing the camp for 26 years. Nothing has changed. Same thing with the league as I try to bridge it, even though there's competition. And what I like that you said is you're like, now wait, I'm not the non-competitive guy. I'm not yeah. the give everyone a trophy thing, but there is a balance here where we have to keep the kids in the forefront and that's what we lose sight of focusing on competing is great yeah focusing on winning is terrible <laughs> right yeah like you can't teach winning there's no such thing right if you could teach winning everyone would teach winning right the the secret right the college teams that i work with it's all about can you show up and compete every day Right. And if you compete and practice, you get a little bit better and you string enough of those together, you're going to be better at the game and you string enough weeks together and months together and years together. That's when you get really good. And 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 so it's like, don't show up to win, because when you show up to win. Right. Think about all the things that determine winning that are outside of your control. Um, the opponent, officials, weather, if it's an outdoor sport, bad calls you know, funny bounces, you don't control any of those. So if you show up and the only thing is win, you don't really feel confident because you don't control it. When you show up to compete, right? Effort, focus, hustle, preparation, nutrition, sleep, whatever, that's competing, right? And if I show up to compete, I can feel confident because I'm just taking care of all the things that are in front of me that belong to me. And then the, the chips fall where they may. Um, and, and so those are two really important mentalities that I think people confuse. And if you teach your teams day after day, just show up and compete, show up and compete, you'll probably win a lot more than you lose. Right. Um, but you'll get better. You'll learn. And you won't sit there going, the only thing we did was show up to win. I mean, I just got off the phone before our interview with, you know, a, a hockey director who, who, you know, was talking about a, a coach who, took kids on a 10 hour trip to some tournament and some kids got three total minutes of playing time. Ah, yeah. Right. And it was like, and, and so it's like, okay. And so those parents just dropped $2,000 on that trip and their kid played three minutes. They're not coming back next year. Right. Their friends aren't coming back. Like what was the point? And you didn't win the tournament anyway. Right. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that, that drives me crazy because that's so misguided of what is the purpose of sport. So when you were going into that TED talk, like you said, you were like worried about what you're going to be able to say in that 14 minutes. And you knew there was so much information. That's how I'm feeling right now, because I feel like I can make this a 10 part series. I have so many questions. So they're like rattling through my brain. So I want to get the hard ones out of the way because yeah. I do want your thoughts on it. And number one would be the officials. I don't, get the treatment of officials. I've never understood. I don't know if it's a, I just have the heart for the official. I realize they're human. I realize they're going to make mistakes, but it goes to what you're saying. That should not be or dictate how a game, you know, ends up, right? So what is, what is your, what are your thoughts on officials and the treatment of officials? Well, I mean, first of all, 3 years ago we already had a massive shortage of officials. And then COVID just exacerbated that a ton, right? So I don't know about your area, but I don't know of any area that's like, oh yeah, we got plenty of referees. We got plenty of umpires, like everyone's hurting, mm -hmm. right? I also know that there used to be this steady stream of young kids who would jump in and, and learn to be officials. And now I meet parents who they're like, I don't go to my kids' soccer games, but I always go when they're, refereeing because i'm afraid for them right right like that i'm my i'm worried my my kid could be in trouble by some adult on the sideline that is i mean the we should have beyond, less than zero tolerance for that like my god like you know why why would a a why would you be yelling at a 13 year old kid who's refereeing your 10 year old number one um of course they're going to make mistakes they're new and who do you expect to ref? Because if they don't show up, no one's showing up to ref, 
right? And so it's just crazy. You know, it drives me crazy the things to that people argue over, like in soccer, you know, a throw in 70 yards from the opponent's goal. Like really you're going to yell and scream at the referee for messing that up when they're probably just going to give it right back to your team anyway here. Like what's the point, right? I, you know, I think when sometimes when games get out of hand and player safety is an issue, right. Coaches in a respectful way saying, you know, Hey ref, like calm it down a little bit here. Like someone's going to get hurt, call it tighter or whatever you know, that that's a thing, but, you know, usually your players react to the coach's body language. And if you want them to be calm, then you need to be calm. That is my number one pet peeve. And yeah. it's cause I, I always tell the coaches and I will do it on a weekly basis. I have no problem communicating that because it's so important because once you don't say it, then it kind of slips away. Is that you, the coach, I appreciate that you're a volunteer. You're probably there for your kid. Let's admit it. Nine out of 10 people who coach usually have their kid on the team. You set the tone. Yeah. Okay. Parents don't set the tone. The refs don't set the tone. The players don't set the tone. Site director, scorekeeper, scoreboard operator do not set the tone. You set the tone because it's when you get, you know, up in arms about a call or my favorite one, making calls from the sidelines, which I, that's another pet peeve of mine, but you can see that they set the tone. Would you agree? I mean, for sure, because they'll lead their, the, the kids tone and then the, and then the kids will, and then the parents will get upset and, and whatever. Um, But, but I mean, you also set the tone for your parents when, you know, you say like, I've, I've, I've coached where the parents are getting out of hand. I've called the referee over and be like, Hey, I'm going to walk around there right now and tell them to zip it. Um, Are you okay with that? And they're like, yeah, please do that. You know? And so, I mean, sometimes it's hard, right? Like you, you know, it's probably different on a basketball court than it is on a soccer field where the parents are 75 yards away. I don't, I don't hear everything. Um, But yeah you you set the tone and you also as a coach set the expectations for your team of how we do things here and you're setting the expectation of oh it's okay for the parent to coach on the sideline yell at the referees and yell at the kids or you set the expectation that that's not okay and if you're not okay with that no problem here's your player card see you later yeah yeah and i i like when you said that earlier is that sometimes like it's hard for me to like say no to people because i want them to be a part of like what we're doing, which is creating that positive culture. And I think we've done a good job of that, but you're always going to have your few that come in. And those are, honestly, those are hard conversations to have and conversations I don't like to have, but I also know for the big picture, they're the important ones to have because I think 95% of the people, just like it was coming out of COVID, that wanted to just come back and just be in a gym and play basketball. So same thing with this. They don't want the yelling coaches and parents and this and that and with the referees what i try to say is listen they're a part of our family because like we're with a group that has been with us for at least 10 years the same people are coming to referee and i kind of like how you said it too like you know we as parents don't go to a game thinking okay what are we going to do to create chaos kind of deal same thing with the referees they're not they're not going there thinking or wanting one team to win over the other they are simply going there to do their job you know do they make mistakes they absolutely do but we have to you said it one of your blogs about uh, approaching 2021 approach it with grace patience and kindness and i took that word grace and I spoke that on a weekly basis. Give everyone grace. Right. Yeah, yeah. totally. Give give them grace. Um, understand that they're not going to be perfect. Thank them for their effort and, and whatever. And I mean, like, you know, it's just, it's it's such a, I mean, I, I've sat, you know, I sat next to some college basketball referees once on an airplane and they were watching game film. Right. Like here they are, they had done the game and then they're getting better. Like you don't see that. Right. But they're studying it. And I had a world cup referee on the podcast and he, you know, he talked about how they prep for games and I'm like, wow, like I never would have thought that that's what goes in as a referee of, you know, how the assistants can look for this and I'm going to look for this and this is where I need you to do. So there's a lot that goes into that. And, and again, 
pro sports is the worst model. Like, yeah. don't look at pro sports, right? That's sport for entertainment. That's not sport for development. And and that sport, you know, to win and those jobs depend on winning and, and things like that. And that one bad in there's, you know, VAR and instant replay and all these different things to help those referees out. Well, yeah, your U12 baseball ump doesn't have the benefit of the doubt for that strike call, which, by the way, he had a much better look at than you did anyway, you know? <laughs> so that leads into my next big question, because some of the names I've mentioned that are affiliated with Positive Coaching Alliance are NBA coaches. You know, you got Steve Kerr, as we mentioned, uh, Doc Rivers, Phil Jackson, obviously a Hall of Famer and stuff. And so I'm curious of why they would jump on board, but they know that their product is exactly what we said. It's it's not the model to go after. Where is that balance between them? Because there's a lot of interaction behind the scenes. I think all you have to do is look at Jordan rules and see really what was going on with how yeah. Phil was trying to, you know, yeah. Make sure that team was being able to stay together and cohesive, but speak to that because obviously these are voices that want to get out a positive message, but yet they're in an environment where sometimes it's completely the opposite. It's the cash 22. And, you know, I, I've enjoyed serving on this PCA national advisory board. Um, and I mean, I've been lucky enough to have Steve Kerr on the podcast a couple of times, Brad Stevens, um, you know, some others, Quinn Snyder as another NBA coach, Tara Vanderveer, Stanford basketball, um, you know, just great, great coaches, great people. And, you know, that's the catch 22 um, of if you want people to listen, put a big name out there and people will click. Um, but the reality that they work in is not the reality that you work in, that you coach in. So, don't look at what they do on the sideline and they're working with professional athletes in those people's case, men, right. Who make millions of dollars a year and have all sorts of different pressures and things going on in their lives. It's a very different situation. So why would you think that you need to coach like they do? Right. right. And if you really want to coach like Steve Kerr, don't watch him on TV, go to practice. <laughs> Right. Watch him interact over the course of the day with, with athletes and have conversations and coach a practice and whatever. That's what we see. You know, the, the, the ESPN highlight is the worst thing we could ever model our behavior on, because, you know, even when you see that coach being really direct and, and, and yelling at a player, what you haven't seen is 99% of their interactions where they have built this relationship of love and trust and whatever that those loud words that player goes, those are for, out of love for me because Steve has been in my corner for eight years, helping me, helping my family, whatever. So yeah, he's telling me something, right? When you're, you know, a basketball coach and at the second practice, you scream at some kid who barely knows who you are, doesn't even remember your name. That's terrible, right? That's not what Steve Kerr would do in that situation. <laughs> so no i like that i like that that there's so much behind the scenes when we talk about officials you know steve kerr and, and nba coaches or professional coaches there's so much more going on so that's good that's good to be able to say okay you know what listen got to have perspective on that and uh you're right sometimes we try to equate the others and or with each other and it really doesn't work that way so my next big question i've got i've got i'm reeling them off here um is that you coached and have seen the different levels, okay? So, you know, primarily for you, it's it's about you sports, but you've coached collegiately, you've coached in the high school level, and within this book, Every Moment Matters, I like the fact that you showed, like, kind of the different levels. So for you personally, what are the big similarities between the different, I guess, uh, those regions or whatever, and what are the big differences that you've been able to see that you could share with us? You know, I'll use an acronym that Jerry and I use a lot in our presentations that I think is a big similarity, and, and we call it the river, right? And that stands for, you know, if, if you want an athlete, if you want a human being to react in a positive way, right, we say bathe them in the river, make them feel relevant, inspired, validate them, empower them, respect them, right? If you do those things, 
people perform their best. If you, you know, if you don't believe that, do the opposite, right? If you don't feel respected, if you have no say, no power, if no one validates what you say or what you want, right? If you don't feel like you have a role and you're bored to death, are you going to perform well? No, of course you're not. So, so whether you're coaching six-year-olds or 26-year-olds, these things are the same. Now, what makes a six-year-old feel relevant is different than what makes a 26-year-old feel relevant, right? So be smart about it. But, you know, everyone wants to feel loved. And every, everyone wants to know that my coach, my teacher, my mentor is in it for me um, and, and, and has my best interest in mind. Right. That doesn't matter what level they are, a division one college athlete or a rec player. Does this coach have my best interest in mind and, and act in a way that that demonstrates that to me on a daily basis? If that's the case, I'm going to love that coach. Right. Um, you know, differences. I mean, again, what's the level who's in front of me? What's their level of motivation, inspiration? Why are they there? What's the inputs into them? Um, all that sort of stuff, because, you know, there's division one athletes that are super highly motivated, super hard work. And there's division one athletes that are just coasting. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, the, the challenge is to know the difference. Two segments in and one more to go with John O'Sullivan, founder of Change in the Game Project. We are talking youth sports, such a passion of mine. And so it's great to have someone like John on the program. Hope you're enjoying the conversation. I'd like to recognize two more of our sponsors. They have been with me since day one. Of course, I am talking about Pit Boss Jerky. Joe Green featured in episode number 26. He's got 13 different flavors of beef jerky. So if you're a beef jerky lover, I'm going to give you a phone number. Okay, 916-769-6807. That is to get on the order board. And I know I've been talking for months about a website coming. I am proud to report I just got a note from Joe that something is indeed just around the corner. So where you'll be able to order some of this great beef jerky online. He just came out with a barbecue flavor, but the one I like, experience the buzz. That's right, we got one named right after the podcast. Before that, I loved raspberry apple chipotle, still do. There's a keto mix. Then you get to the original six, which are pepper garlic, uh, Pit Boss original, sweet summer, honey gold, sweet and smoky, and little heat. He's got great names and great flavors. Indeed, you can find the beef jerky that is going to suit you. And what I love about it, he's local, okay? He's right here. Again, that number to get on the order board to order your beef jerky is 916-769-68. Oh, 07. And we'd also like to recognize R5 Stitch and Print, led by Troy Rousey. His story, an amazing one, is featured in episode 25. So you can go back to back with Pit Boss Jerky and R5 Stitch and Print. The website for R5 is r5print.com. You can call them at 916 454 3773. Their strength is the fact that they do great work. It's as simple as that. They've got an in-house graphic designer that will help build a logo for you or even sit down with you and just come up with a concept of things you might want for your business or even on a personal matter. So if you got any like company swag coming up, R5 is the place to go. So again, that's R5 Stitch and Print at r5print.com. So big thank you, Pit Boss Jerky, R5 Stitch and Print, Proud sponsors of Experience the Buzz. Now, let's get to the final segment with our guest today, John O. Sullivan. Today's talking story is with John O. Sullivan, something I've, or just a, a conversation I have been very much looking forward to. And, and today we are making it happen. And so I'm so glad to be able to share uh, this knowledge that John has been able to share with us. And uh, we've talked about his TED Talk. We've talked about kind of everything he's affiliated with, the fact that he's an author of two books, of which we'll put in the show notes. Uh, I have both of them, but this one is on my shelf. So that's kind of an honor, right? You know, when you look in the background and someone has a bookshelf like you do, right? And you see, you know, your book. So just know, John, your book Thank is you. on my bookshelf. So Thank you. <laughs> You could you know, be holding the door in place. So that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, as the door holder, but that is not the case. It has a nice, it's in good, in good uh, condition as well. And then the podcast, uh, the Way of Champions podcast, 
And, and that just, you know, gets me to the fact that I'm looking at all this and you have found so many different ways to be able to get this message out. Can you kind of take me through that process? It started with the blog and just like kind of take me through and, you know, what, what does that look like for well, you? Started because... with the, it, start, it started with a book, right? Yeah, into the book, blog, yes. Mm -hmm. Into speaking. I mean, what, what I realized, and I really realized this when um, uh, I put the uh, podcast out first was, you know, at that point, I had tens of thousands of people on a blog newsletter list. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, you know, great, like I'm gonna start a podcast and all these people are gonna listen to my podcast. And, and, and you realize that actually it's a completely different audience, yeah. right? And, and your social media audience is different than someone who will spend five, 10 minutes reading a 2000 word blog, right? Some people want, you know, they've got, you get them for five seconds. And so we live in this like noisy world. And I think too many people get caught up on trying to be everything for everyone. And, and so just said, hey, you know, we'll produce social media content and that's for these people here. And then we'll produce you know, a blog and that's for someone there. And people say, oh, your blogs are too long. They need to be 500 words or less or whatever. I'm like, no, that's not who I'm writing for, right? Right. I'm writing for someone who's, who wants a, a thoughtful article and not just clickbait, right? And, and the podcast is a different audience, right? As you know, right? Someone who's going to spend an hour with you a week, um, that is a much more invested fan than someone who spends five minutes on a blog, than someone who spends five seconds on a tweet. Um, and so, and then, you know, and then, you know, someone who spends many hours on a book um, and then someone who spends money and days coming to a conference, right. you know, these are all different levels of engagement. Um, but 90% of what we do, we give away for free, <laughs> right? So there's your blog, there's social, there's a podcast. So when someone says, how, why are you charging for this? I'm like, well, you know, there's a lot of free stuff out there, man. <laughs> there is. Yeah. Without a <laughs> doubt. So of all those platforms, which, which is the one that you enjoy the most, not to say you don't enjoy them all, because like you said, they're kind of different, but is there one that like that, that's what you're all about. I'll tell you what I hate the most is social media. Okay. <laughs> social media. Okay. All that's right. Amazing answer. I don't blog as much as, as I used to, because the podcast, you know, I really enjoy the podcast mm -hmm. um, because these type of conversations are really engaging and exciting to me. I love being a guest and I love doing the interview because I learned so much and, yeah. you know, I'm not going to speak for you, but like I, I started the podcast to get information out to other people. And at this point it's like, man, it's kind of for me. Like I just get to talk to fascinating right. people and, 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 you know, learn great stuff. So, so anyway, that's, that's a cool thing. Um, but, but they're all different. I mean, I love live events. I love speaking. You cannot get on zoom and match the energy in the room of a group of coaches or a group of people who have invested a weekend in getting better. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of different things. Well, I can't believe that we waited to almost about an hour into the conversation, but I did want to hit on it is the reason you're here is because you are the founder of Change in the Game Project. And so for someone who may not know what that's about, could you kind of give us the skeleton of, of what that entails? Yeah, I mean, we've been probably talking about all the components here already. Yes. And really, you know, the mission of this was, uh, as I said many times, put a little more play back and play ball, mm -hmm. right? That that make sport about the needs, values, and priorities of the children playing and not the adults coaching, running the league, whatever it is. And I just thought that this was such an important um, thing that, that mo again, most people out there, they just want good information. And so could I be a place, could Changing the Game Project be a place where people could get that information? And they can get it now in lots of different forms, whether you want an audio book, whether you want to read a book, whether you want stuff by video, come to a live event, um, read on social media, listen to a podcast, whatever, kind of covered all, all the medians and, and just, um, you know, that that's what you know, that's what it is. And so it, it's been an incredible journey to watch the list of people grow and the followers. And, and, and what's really amazing to you is like the people who, you know, 
I'm almost 10 years into it here now, right? Or about 10 years in. And the people who just say, hey, you know, I've been reading your stuff for five years, right? And they've never reached out before. Um, that's what's really cool, you know, is is like knowing that. And, you know, you save the, my relationship with my son or, man, you changed the way that our basketball league runs or things like that. And that's what's really cool because it's very easy to look at, you know, youth sports issues and, and say, oh man, like it's people say you even making a difference, right? Is positive coaching alliance even making a difference. And it's like on a macro scale. Yeah, I think so. But on a micro scale, when someone says you saved my relationship for my son, like that's the paycheck, right? That's the, right. that's the email that g- goes in my folder and gets saved for those days when I'm feeling like, man, this isn't working. This is a nightmare. I read through a couple of those and, and go, okay, there we go. Right. Like that's why I do this. Right. One person at a time. Yeah. And those are, I mean, just from my standpoint, like I am always sharing your resources and I, I try to include them uh, either within my blog or newsletter or something like, Hey, just read this, just like, check it out. And like you said, you don't know who is or who isn't, but if it's just that one person or that one coach, it's like, that's all you can do because as we said before, you can't really ram this stuff down their throat to say, this is the way it is, right? right. You really have to do it slowly and it's all about the approach. I, I like how you said it. it is about the approach of, you know, are you open to wanting to be better? Which I think if you ask most human beings, they are, but then there's going to be some that are just stuck in their ways. And in that case you say, well, you know, maybe this is just not the place. So trying to really simplify things and, you know, talk about too about COVID because COVID was really strange because now we're in this place where we're like, okay, we reflected, right? We're going to be better people. And then all of a sudden it's either gone back to the same or it's even in some cases worse. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the sad part, right? Like we never thought we'd have this sports reset and we got it. And some people have, have done well with it, but for others, it just became uh, again, even a, a faster race to nowhere. Cause they felt like, Oh my God, we missed a year right? or whatever. And so, you, you know, I, I don't, but I think sport is also a reflection of society, right? And right now society is stressed, scared, angry, short tempered, whatever. And, and sport is reflecting that right now. So there are more issues with coaches, more issues with parents trying to get coaches fired, more parents scared that their kid is getting screwed over and let's get rid of the coach or let's jump teams, more kids transferring colleges. It's just, yeah, I don't, I I don't know, but I, I just, I, you know, so I I've gotten asked, I got asked for a reporter asked me the other day, is parent sideline behavior getting worse? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. I, I think maybe right now, because everyone's just stressed out. I'm like, but also everyone has a video camera, so no one gets away with it anymore. Um, so the, yeah, there, there, there's no such thing as, you know, an incident with a referee that's not now on social media. So are we just seeing it more? I don't know. It's hard, hard to say. Yeah. Grace, patience, kindness. I know you say approaching 2021, but go ahead and just carry it right into 2022. So uh, I want to end this way, like for you now with your life being centered around this subject, which is great. And again, I I just feel like I live vicariously through you and what you're putting out there. And I love that. Um, And trying to be an example of that from which what I do, but can you recall like for yourself, a great sports memory, you know, as, as a kid, and then maybe from a coaching standpoint, is there one that sticks out? I'm curious if you have one of those in each category. Yeah, I, I mean, define define kid. You know, I remember, you know, my my senior year of high school, our soccer team winning a championship uh, mm-hmm. yeah, as a big underdog, and that was such a cool thing. And I was actually injured; I'd broken my leg, but that was like one of my fondest memories. And you know, one of my teammates is you know had a successful pro and national team career and 
you know, he, he's actually the assistant coach at Manchester United right now. And he's nice. like, that's one of my fondest memories is like mm-hmm. that. Cause you're with your friends. And, and so I love school sport for that. And club sport doesn't have that camaraderie and playing in front of your friends and representing a school and all that. And so I, I hate in new sport. Now there's this dismissal of high school sports as useless mm-hmm. and a waste of time because you just cannot, you know, maybe the level of play is higher in AAU or this or whatever, but the level of, of care <laughs> and pride is way higher playing for your school. So that's it. And, you know, as a coach, I mean, my, my proudest moments are probably moments where teams have, have lost, but, but done something special in that moment or, you know, in, in a moment where everyone else lost their heads, we didn't, you know, yeah. um, you know, uh, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that I remember of, I, I mean, I have, I, you know, in, in my office on, on this shelf, I I've only kept like two trophies ever. Um, one was this uh, U16 girls soccer team that we went to an event in Phoenix and everyone got uh, like norovirus, and oh. we're all vomiting and everything. And, and somehow we still made it all the way through and lost in the final. Um, and I was like subbing players out during the final so they could run to the trees and puke and then go back in and whatever. And it was just a, this crazy experience that we all still talk about. And the coaches were sick and it was just awful. But I don't know. I, well, like I remember that moment a lot more than things we won. Memories, memories. Mm-hmm. Rec AAU, I think that's something, if you could hit on that before we, you know, leave too, because I think it's a big thing. So like for me, I have no, I, I used to think differently years ago that, oh, maybe we're not enough kind of thing, you know, that, you know, everybody was aspiring to be AAU. And then I had one of these light bulb moments going, wait, 95% of the people that participate in my league simply want a rec basketball league. Mm-hmm. And you know what? From that moment on, I like I proudly say I embrace the fact that we are rec basketball. And then that way it helps me filter out because if I get those calls and I hear the parent describing for me, right? In that way of like, okay, yeah, they are definitely not buzzard ball material. They probably should go play AAU that I can give them that information. But I love the fact now that I can embrace being a rec program. And I think a lot of parents appreciate that because I don't think there's enough of those that are able to say that up front. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I don't know if this is a great analogy, but McDonald's shouldn't have pizza. Like, right. right? Well, if you, if you're going to McDonald's, don't go for pizza, go to the pizza place. Right. And, and so it's okay to not be, again, not be everything for everyone. I mean, the restaurants that I guarantee you that I never go into is the one that says like Chinese, Italian, you know, Mediterranean food. Like, no, you know, if your menu yeah. is more than three pages, I'm out. Like, give me a break. So, so falling into that category, would that be the same as the A and W slash KFC? That's a little strange uh, that they know. do Maybe that. I, <laughs> but but I know what you're saying, right? It's like if I go to AW, I want the root beer. If I go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, I want the chicken. I you know mixing the two is like yeah, probably not a good idea. Yeah, you know. So but you know to get back to sports, right? Like again, just this is who we are. This is what we do, yeah. and 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 serve that. And I think. You know, like I said, we started this saying how cool it is that your values are on the wall, because if you know what you stand for, then you're not afraid to say this isn't for you. And the biggest problem that I see with community based sports organizations is they don't know who they are. They don't know what they do. And so then they try to they get off track by that parent that you just described the phone call with who thinks this should be more that this should be AAU for 90 bucks a season um, and we should do all these things and my kid's the best, right? Or why are we making even teams? We need to get all the seven-year-olds who are the best together right now or my kid's going to fall apart. And, you know, don't try to be everything for everyone. Know who you are. Know what you do well. And know be proud. who you are. I love that. That's perfect. So if people want to get a hold of you or see your information, even though we're going to include it in the show notes, maybe kind of give us a rundown because there's so many ways to find out what you're doing. 
Yeah. So, I mean, changing the game project.com is the, um, the mothership blog podcast on there. The podcast call way of champions. You can get that on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcast, um, the books you can get at bookstores or Amazon, things like that, you know, and, um, yeah. And then, you know, we just, we just announced our 2022 online. We're doing our conference online again this year in June. And, uh, we got Steve Kerr lined up. We got, uh, Dave Diggerson, who's the men's basketball coach at, uh, university of South Carolina upstate, just an awesome guy. Um, Dave Aranda, who the Baylor head football coach, um, Sandy Barber, the Penn state athletic director, Keisha Walker, Boston college, uh, lacrosse coach. So these are all NBA champions, NCAA champions, just people who've been there and, and, and done that in the coaching realm. And it's, it's going to be a pretty cool event. So on the website, you can find that as well. If you want to take a really deeper dive into the work that we do. Well, terrific. John, thank you for this amazing opportunity. Uh, was everything I thought it would be. And then some, thank you, man. This was great. All right. That's all I got for now. Talk to you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Wow. What a great conversation. And again, if you were listening all the way through, watching on YouTube, I really hope you enjoyed it and bookmark this one. Uh, It's a big one. You know, youth sports is such an important part of our kids' lives. And uh, with me being in the space, I, I just know that as a coach, as a parent, we just it's so important to have the proper perspective. I know it's not easy. Uh, there's a lot of pressures. As of course, John alluded to a lot of that, but I think he gave a lot of great knowledge today that you can really kind of put your finger on and say, okay, that makes sense. I would ask you to take one small step and try using that phrase. I love watching you play. Just start with that and just see what it does. Get away from the conversations of analyzing what has gone on because no doubt about it, it is about our kids having fun. They will figure things out along the way. The story about Kobe Bryant, now that, that was very, very powerful. Just think if his dad had not said what he said, what it might've done, who knows? But uh, well, we know what his story was, an amazing one as a basketball player in the NBA. So that'll put the bow on this one. Really hope you enjoyed the conversation. Of course, we'll have another great episode coming your way next week. That's all I got for now. Talk to you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining Steve this week on Experience the Buzz. Steve would love to hear from you. Leave a review or contact Steve directly with any questions at scbuzzard at gmail.com. To see the other adventures of Steve Buzzard, be sure to visit buzzardball.com.